never watched a 3D movie? How many of you have seen a 3D movie by show of hands? Most of you, most of you. Well, 3D movies, if you haven't seen, creates this visual experience, right? Like a sense of depth that a 2D, a 2D image cannot uh, project. And it's an immersive experience. And back in the days, I think pre-COVID, most of the movies that was coming out was all 3D, right? Uh, and I'm, as you probably know, I am very much a big fan of visual, creating visual experiences and all that. And, and, and as you know, I study movies and this is, I'm, I'm generally very frugal or I'm very cheap. <laughs> but when it comes to movies and I spend money, so I splurged um, myself. Actually, I bought a 3D projector. Uh, and I bought a 3D Blu-ray player, and I bought a 3D, all this surround sound system. I purchased a complete 3D home theater set, but then I realized that the most important thing to purchase, I didn't have money, which is a house to put all of this thing in, right? <laughs> So we live in an apartment, so if I put switch that thing on, I'll be kicked out of that apartment in 24 hours. So, so that, but the only thing that is left of all these glasses, right? This is not something I stole from the theaters. This is something I paid for. Um, it's because when you watch a movie, 3D movie, you go to the theater, there'll be an usher standing by. We all get these glasses, you remember, right? Like even with the glasses, you put this thing on, and then suddenly the experience starts, and the movie, the, the images jump out of the screen because these, are, these lenses are polarized in different directions. Anyway, the technology doesn't matter. But then you kind of like, you're touching, and people will be sitting in the theater doing this, and whoa, like this, and because the image come out of the screen, but once in a while, I do this, and I'm sure you have all done this. I just, just look at like this. What's really happening without the glasses, right? You have all done that, I know. So, so you know, when I look back, have you, have you, have you, you know, tried that? Then you see the image on the screen is really blurry. It's actually different kind of, there are multiple images kind of melding to each other you would rather watch a 2D uh, movie and see it clear than watching a 3D movie without glasses. It won't make any sense to us. Because the challenge of visual technology at that time is to project a three-dimensional image into a two-dimensional screen, which is impossible. There is no way you can project a 3D image in a 2D screen. If it is impossible <laughs> for all the science and technologies to do that, our attempt to comprehend the nature of a 3D God, or I call it a triune God, with our flat time and space continuum in which we live is impossible. It's impossible. Nobody, that's why Trinity or the uh, concept of triune God has been confounding. This, this mystery has been, uh, uh, has been there in the church circle for two millennia, two millennia, 2,000 plus years. And today we are going to solve this in 20 minutes, okay? <laughs> the reason I'm saying this is it is a futile task in a way to understand a mystery. Like I said in the beginning of the series, I said, God, the existence of God is not a problem to be solved, but a mystery to be explored. A mystery cannot be solved. That doesn't mean that we sit there and do nothing, but a mystery can be explored. The more you explore the mystery, the more exciting it becomes. That's why we are trying to explore the mystery of a triune God. We are trying to project this 3D image into a 2D uh, screen, even though we know that it is going to be blurry. 
So any sermon you have ever heard about Trinity or Triune God, which I have not heard from a church pulpit for, uh, for almost 30 plus years of my Christian life, because it's not something you can preach just like that, because it doesn't matter what the preacher says, it is considered heretic by at least one other person. Anything you, he, so I'm going to start with a disclaimer, okay? Anything you hear from this pulpit can be perceived as heretic. So take it with a grain of salt and don't complain to me. I'm starting by saying that way. So, but because we are exploring a mystery rather than trying to solve a problem. Would you stand with me for the reading of the word? By the way, the last two weeks, we've been reading the scripture towards the end of the sermon because I said the existence of God or the identity of God is something we should be able to articulate without the scripture, but today Trinity or Triune God is a concept from the scripture, so we are starting with the scripture. From now on, verse, everything we are going to look at will be scripture-based, the theology, systematic theology one-on-one, so I'm going to start the sermon with the, with the, so some of you think that, oh, he ended the sermon? So don't get too excited. We do, this is not the end. This is the beginning. Okay? So Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Right off the bat, we need to admit that Trinity is not from the Bible in the sense that the word Trinity or triune God is not explicitly mentioned in the Bible, but Trinity is of the Bible. What it is, one way to say it, is a complex theological construct devised by the church fathers to make sense of the nature of God. It is a model, right? Like we work with models that explain the in something that we cannot comprehend. That's why we use model. Like in science, we use different models, and a couple of them, which I'm very familiar, I'm going to show uh, two models, uh, which, uh, you know, one, the first one you see is the model of an atom, right? The model or atom, you have, elect uh, you have protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and the, and the electrons are circling. And then the next one is alternating current, where, you know, uh, the electrons are going in a sine wave format as opposed to direct current. Now, when you look at some of these models, nobody has seen really electrons with their naked eyes. Electrons are elude direct observation. But we infer their positions and their behavior based on experiment. Nobody has really seen it. When you look at a model like this, you, you kind of look like, oh, you know, uh, the first one is like uh, electrons are having like a party. Like, you know, they have, you know, they're going circling around and it's like a merry-go-round. You know, the electrons are traveling around the nucleus having fun. And the next one, the alternating current electrons are actually on a roller coaster. Wee, wee, wee. That's not what at all. That's not what it is. Nobody has a clue how exactly they behave, but we create a framework to understand this model, and sometimes it keeps changing. For example, the, the atom model, and even before that model, that's a classic model, before that, 
We had Bohr's model, which looked very different. And then now with string theory, they changed the model a little bit. Now with the quantum mechanics and all that, the model, that model I showed you is kind of outdated. But we still need the model. So the models are not really reality in a way, but it is an abstraction of reality. It is a bridge between what is known and what is not knowable. There is no way you can know this. So you create a, 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 a bridge, right? Like, you know, it's a model that creates to, to articulate the reality that is revealed in the Bible. So Trinity, the triune God, I would say is a theological model. It's not like you go to one scripture and here is tri triune God, here is Trinity, nothing like that. We had to develop, like the scientists had to develop these models from the observable nature to articulate the reality of the inexplicable nature of, of this cosmos, we have to, as theologians, had to create a model of the Bible to understand how God behaves in a way, or the nature of God is revealed in a way. Does that make sense? So the triune God is a model. So here is a model of the triune God. I'll show you the picture. I'll take, give you a free few moments to look at it. I know, it is just as complicated as the model of Adam or the model of alternating current. So we believe God expresses himself in the Bible as three persons. One, in one God, what we say, right? One God in three persons. Or we say, well, the, the original word, the Greek word is three hypostasis, hypostasis, hypostasis <laughs> in one usia. A hypostasis really means an identity, individuality. That's what it means. Usia really means being, the act of being or, or essence, or substance, that's what it means. So three individual identities in one essence. Now these three identities are distinct, distinct, but not divided. They are different, but not separate, okay? Distinct, not divided. Different, but not separate. <laughs> And they are co-equal, co-eternal, and consubstantial. Basically, this means the same thing, and this existence. So I'm going to come back to this, but I want you to get the model, okay? This is the model. Now, then you would say, why in the world should you do all of this? These people who are studying theology, they have nothing else to do. Why don't we just believe in one God, like the Bible very clearly says, why do you want to create all this complicated model? Genuine question. Because here is the problem, though. So when you read the Bible, what happens if you don't have Trinity? Just go straight forward, simple model of God. So I'm going to read some verses. Genesis chapter 126, which is what we read today, it says, this is the first time we really hear God kind of interacting apart from the creation, uh, the first creation. So here God says, let us make mankind in our image. So it was a, a bit confusing that who is God speaking? Let us, there is, there is the, there, there is a plurality within singularity. There is a divine plurality that we observe. But then we also can think that it is more of a stylistic devices or what we call linguistic 
uh, flourish to 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 kind of uh, to denote somebody who is very important. Like, you know, the the kings and all the used to address themselves in plural, right? Like you know, we the king of, right? Like you know, we in most languages, particularly in the Eastern language, we use single person to address in plural because they are very reverential. So that kind of makes sense. So so that doesn't mean really there are there is a plurality within singularity. So yeah, but it's still odd still odd right but then you go to the next scripture three genesis 322 i'm just reading from genesis 322 now here is another problem after the fall god is kicking the humanity out of the garden of eden there he say there god says the man has now become like one of us now that cannot be a stylistic device that cannot be just a like a that's not something shows reverence, but there is, a, there is an interaction within Godhood. There is, there is that plurality. And then, in other words, Genesis 11, 7, the, the Tower of Babel story, where God says, come, let us go down and confuse their language. So now, God is talking to somebody else, definitely. Somebody who is very co-equal. So you can see it just doesn't make sense. Now you go to uh, De Deuteronomy 6.4, which is the key verse according to the Jewish people. The key verse of the Bible, they call it the Shema Israel, Shema, Shema prayer. Which says, as you can see, the Lord our God is one. Deuteronomy 6.4, the idea of monotheism is based on this one verse. But here is the funny part. The word God used there is plural, Elohim. So while it says that God is one, but the word God is in itself almost like God's. So, you know, that, that, that strikes odd. You can see there is a, even though the meaning of this is singular, the syntax which is used is plural. There is something more to it than we can really understand, right? Now when it comes to, so there is a divine plurality within the singularity of God that is undeniable. I can go and, and read verses after verses you know, the whole day, because there is that plurality somehow is in there. Now, when you come to the New Testament, this plurality is a little more defined. It is not like plural, there are so many. There are three very specific persons or individualities or hypostases of God. Now, I'm going to read some verses. Matthew chapter 3 16, 17, this is the baptism scene. It is God showing up. There are three dimensions or three individualities of one God shows up here. It says, Jesus came up immediately from the water. He saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and light, lighting on, on him. And behold, a voice out of heaven, which is obviously the Father, said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So the, here you see the manifestation of a triune God. You see a Father, and then the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? Then you go to John chapter 15, 26. Jesus said, When the Helper comes, which he's talking about the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. There are the three individualities almost used in one sentence to frame how God is going to deal with us. Now, this is more very explicitly mentioned in the Great Commission, as you know. Matthew chapter 28, 19, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
And we know that you cannot just add some other people's or other identities to God's identity in a single sentence. It is very clearly written as co-equal individualities, identities, right? And the disciples continued that formula throughout the... Again, I can stand here and read many, many verses from the New Testament too. I'll give you two samples. Paul almost always used this greeting. The grace of... The, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You can see. And Peter did the same thing. And again, I can read many... Blessed be, 1 Peter 1, 3 to 12, I'm kind of encapsulating it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, through, through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit. So you can see, there is the three identities, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, somehow coexist in a divine dance, a celestial dance in which these three identities move and they, 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 they exist as this, this, this uh, beings who are co-equal and they act with a united purpose. And that's the nature of God which is revealed both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So the point is that if you don't have a concept of Trinity, then the Bible becomes even more incredible than, which is, you know, again, in a scientific worldview, a theory is, is something that can solve more or answer more questions than it raises. All theories raises questions, but the best theory is the one we can, it can answer more questions than the theory raises. So you think Trinity is complicated, and reading the Bible with Trinity is complicated. Reading the Bible without Trinity is even more complicated. That's the point. This is why the theologians had this time and they had to spend all this time, the church fathers, all of those. It's not like they wanted to have some kind of fun exercise. They didn't have anything to do. They had to have something like this to understand the nature of God as revealed in the Bible. So, I know we have limitations of time. So let, let's close the Bible for a second. And how, how does this make sense? See, if you ask me, maybe I'm not intellectually that capable. I, I'm never really confused by the concept of Trinity because I think in terms of analogies, right? Say, for example, the, the cosmos, the fabric of the cosmos itself. Did you know that the universe is created by fundamentally three constituents? You probably know this. Matter, space, and time. These are the fundamental constituents of, of the cosmos. Matter, space, and time. And interestingly, matter exists in three different forms. You know that, right? Solid, liquid, Gas. These, these are pure science I'm talking about, right? Then you have space, which always exists in length, width, and breadth, or height, right? Like length, width, and height. And when it comes to time, it exists in, in past, present, and future. There is this, like I said, the fabric of the, the tapestry of cosmos, the ingredient of the cosmos exists in itself like a, in a triad. Obviously, that's not a proof for a Trinitarian God, but it is a compelling parallel. It is a compelling parallel. Because the scripture we read today says, God created us, humanity, in his image and in his likeness. So let us look at that for one uh, for a few minutes, and then I will end. So what that verse today, the, the verse we read today says that we are created, humanity is created in the image and likeness of God, which really means that we are a low-resolution version of God, right? Uh, uh, what does that mean? Like, can we, God created us in, in his image, does that mean that God has eyes and glasses and you know hands and no so which basically says that it is the same fundamental constitution constitution of god's nature is in us too that's what i understand so 
the way I look at it is, if we can reverse engineer our qualities, then we can find at least a glimpse of who God is. So let, let me try to do that. You know, do you, have you heard of this thing called multiple personality disorder, right? People can have multiple personalities, which is a sickness, psychological. Um, Sometimes I used to wonder I had that, because I have, you know. Sometimes I manifest in these multiple personalities, which I kind of struggle with that. Then I realized that all of us have multiple, multiple personality disorder. We don't want to admit it. <laughs> So in my observation of humanity, I've, I'm 54 years old. I lived in four different countries. I know people a little bit, you know. And all humanity, the way I look at it, to generalize, we all have multiple personalities. I would specifically say we all have three different personalities. I'm going to put it out there. This is my speculation. I'm going to call them instinct, intellect, and intuition, okay? I'll explain what that means. Instinct, intellect, and intuition. Just like I gave you three M with the exercise, I'm going to give you three I's to study I or me and yourself, right? Instinct, intellect, and intuition. Now, I want you to know that that is very different from body, mind, and soul. People talk about body, mind, and soul, which really means you have one personality that has three different nature. That's not what I'm talking about. No, that's very different, the tripatriot nature. No, that's not at all. I believe there are three Matthew Jones inside me. There is an instinct Matthew, there is an intellect Matthew, and there is an intuition Matthew, and they don't really like each other. And they often <laughs> get into arguments, very often. And this particularly happens when I go through a drive through at McDonald's. Right? <laughs> so I go there, all I want is a Big Mac, all I want is a burger. And I go and I, I, I want my burger, then the lady asks, do you want fries with that? Right? You all know that French fries is my favorite food. Right? And I believe that French fries is the, is the biggest contribution of, of Western civilization to humanity. That's it, you know, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I become emotional when I talk about French fries, but you know. <laughs> but the point is, the point is that the lady asks, do you want fries with that? Then immediately, the instinct Matthew jump out and say, make it large, lady. Make it large, right? Make it large. That's instinct Matthew, immediately. Then there is another Matthew sitting in the same chair, driving the same, we all say, it's intellect, Matthew. Shouts, cholesterol, right? I have high cholesterol. Say, this comes with that. I take medication. I have to take medication. My dad never had cholesterol. Nobody in my family had cholesterol. But I do have cholesterol. No kidding, you know. So there, there it goes, the other side of it. So intellect, Matthew, said, don't even think about it. No fries. Just a burger that itself is not good, but just no fries, right? There is this conflict between instinct Matthew, and it, that's why I said this is not body, mind, and soul, which is basically the same nature uh, manifesting in three different ways. No, these are two different people who don't like each other, right? <laughs> then there is this third intuition Matthew comes up. Now, he is very subtle. Sometimes I even find it difficult to understand. And, and sometimes he goes with either instinct Matthew Sometimes it goes, he goes with intellect Matthew because he is the arbitrator, arbitrator, right? A person who is choosing between A and B cannot be A and B. It has to be a C. It has to be a third person who is choosing between A and B. So the arbitrator who is intuition Matthew often choose with that, but very, very sometimes, sporadically, he comes up with something completely outside the blue which I don't even, something, hey, do you have salad instead of rice? <laughs> Never happened, but I'm just making an analogy. <laughs> Intuition comes up with something totally out of the blue. Hasn't that happened to you? 
We all are intuitive beings, and that's why we said that, that person is very intuitive, because they, this person is given something which is radically outside the picture. That intuition, quite often in our busy world, we always handle the instinct Matthew and intellect Matthew. We try to suppress the in, intuition Matthew. That's how we live in our, our life. That's why that voice is often suppressed. But there is a distinct entity, which is an intuition Matthew. Right? And another way to say is that when you look at me, you see the intellect Matthew. You normally know me as a oh, nice pastor, great sermons, good looking guy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, very rational, very balanced, very poised, and all of this. This is what you see. But what I see is the instinct Matthew. That's the guy I struggle with. That's my, that's, that's who I am, the way I see it. Intellect Matthew is the way I am, the way you see it. But the way God sees me is the intuition Matthew. The intuition. There is some kind of Wi-Fi connection to something out in the cosmos. We call it the Holy Spirit. That intuition draws this insight Hasn't this happened to you sometime? I can't believe that. I said, oh, wow, I surprised myself. It happens to me very often. I surprised myself. I didn't think that I had the guts to do it. I did it. I didn't know how to answer that question, but I answered it. It just, it's the intuition that comes from somewhere else, the intuition, Matthew. Now, if I am God, if I am God, if I use my superpower, to externalize these three people, which is inside me. When I come to your house, you only give me one chair, but actually there are three people sitting in that chair, right? So, if I am God, if I separate these three Matthews, intellect Matthew, stand here, instinct Matthew, go there, intuition Matthew, go there. Isn't that possible? If I am God, I can externalize these personalities? But the good thing about Godhood is that they are united in purpose. But I am not. I am not. That's the only difference. Because God is God and I live in a fallen world. When the redemption comes, I will have all of these three, three in sync. So it is possible, even logically, to conceive these three Matthew standing here having a conversation, an internal dialogue. People say, oh, if Jesus and God are the same, why is Jesus praying to God the Father? Duh, that's what I happened in the McDonald's, McDonald's drive-thru. There is an internal dialogue. Intellect and, in, intellect and instinct is talking to each other. There is this conversation. So, so there is a way in which we can understand, because I believe the, the scripture gives us the license by saying that we are a low resolution version of God. I believe when God said that we are created in the image and likeness of God, I look at the mirror, I see the best possible visual representation of a triunity right staring at me from the mirror. Because I believe we are also triune entities the way God has created. Now, let me end this by saying, what, why does it matter? Because this, the, triune, the triunity proves to us that God is a relational being. God exists in relationship between Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God's identity is defined by the mutual love between each other. That's why they have a united purpose. That's why the God of the Bible likes to enter into a relationship with people. That is a very Christian term. You go to a Hindu or a Muslim or even a Jew and say, do you have a relationship with God? They will say, what are you, are you crazy? You cannot have a relationship with God, which is with their right. Which they are right. According to their perception, God is not a relational being, but it, according to Christian theology, the very nature of God is communal. 
relation. Like I said, a divine celestial dance in which three identities of God move separately but in sync with each other to accomplish a divine destiny. So that's why we believe in a triune God. Now, let me stop by saying this. There are three points I want you to remember. I don't want to leave you confused. I want you to have the license to get confused. So there are three things I want you to remember at the end of these three sermons. We will continue this in the next week. So there are three points. One, we have to have the humility to appreciate that we cannot fully understand God. Okay? That's where we started. The moment you understand God, God becomes not God. God, by definition, is somebody whom we cannot understand. So that's the first premise. Second premise, we don't have to understand God to experience Him. See, this is the problem. You know, I've been married to Joanne for 25 plus years. Sometimes I wonder, I don't have a clue who she is. The way we, we uh, because each human being is a mystery. If you are going to completely understand another person to get married to that person, best of luck. It'll never happen. So if we don't understand another human being, then how dare you say that I want to know clearly, explicitly how, who God is, then only I will believe. No. So the third one is even better. The more we experience God, the better we understand Him. The more we experience. That's what happens in a marriage, right? The more we experience each other, the now I know Joanne better. Now it's better, so not the other way around. So the point is that at the end of the day, it's not about proving the existence of God. It is not about proving the person of God. It is definitely not about proving the nature of the triune God. It is about entering into a relationship with God to experience Him and in that process understand Him more and more and more. And uh, I just want to show you one last picture. So. Paul says, we watch through, uh, through a dark mirror darkly, right? So here is this verse. Uh, For through him, Jesus, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. What really means is we are, we are looking right now the mystery of God through a triangular kind of a prism, a prism, right? We look through each side. The Old Testament side, uh, saints look through the prism of the Father. They can still see the Son and the Holy Spirit on the other side. But they look through Father, right? And then the New Testament says we are given Jesus Christ. We look to the Father through the prism, this side. We change the side through, through Jesus. And then to the New Testament church, God gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is another sermon for another day. This is why we need to have the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, so that we can have a completely different picture, a di different dimension of looking at the same God. And the positive thing about it is, at the end of the day, when we all die, when we go to heaven, there will be an angel standing there with the glasses, 3D glasses, right, yeah. Everyone will get a glass, right? Glasses, a pair of glasses. And then, only then, you will put this on. And that's when you say, my goodness, it all makes sense now. Now I understand the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Whoa, woo! Like, you know, that experience is coming for us. And I invite you to that experience. Let's pray. Father God, who are we even to even begin to comprehend the reality of an infinite God? We are just finite beings. Just because we have a degree in science or theology, we think that we got the world in our hands. Lord, we apologize for our hubris, our arrogance to lasso the wind to understand God with our mind, but we are also grateful that you made us a low resolution version of who you are.
Thank you for the triune nature that you have given to us, triune personality that you've given to us. And pray that as you are a communal being, we will also be communal being. As you are one, Lord, even though we as a church, even though we are all coming from different parts of the world, different cultures, speak different language, we will become one in you. So the church will also replicate the model of a triune God, which will be the best proof of a triune God the world can ever receive. In Jesus' name, amen.